Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Adriana, shouted the girl, whose cheeks flushed with humiliation and shame. How can you say such a thing? How can you even think such a thing? Did I give you an excuse? Betty stood in the middle of the hall of a small budget cafe called Sea Breeze. But the place had nothing in common with a pleasant sea breeze, really. The interior of Breeze had not changed for many years and looked more like an old canteen. Tablecloths were yellowed and not fully washed from stale stains of borscht or hodgepodge. Speakers filled the room with the sounds of old hits. Heavy yellow curtains kept the sunlight out. Here one could plunge into the atmosphere of the past, so to speak, to feel the spirit of old times or taste it. For example, you could order the huge cheperics, which even had meat in them, or the fried meat patties, or buy a liter of morsel for mere sense. It was a family cafe owned by the couple David and Adriana. They had been running the place for a long time. The owners hoped to soon hand over their powers to their son Ethan. In fact, it was Ethan who started the whole mess. The thing is that just two months ago in this cafe worked Betty, a young girl of incredible beauty, whose appearance immediately caught the eye, forcing even a casual passerby to hold his gaze on her a little longer. Often looking at her, people commented on her interesting exotic appearance, like Betty's father or mother, or at least some great-grandfather, must have been a gypsy. That she had gypsy blood in her veins was hinted at by her thick, raven-winged black hair. She also had dark, deep eyes. In addition, Betty had sensual lips with a clearly drawn cupid's arch and a playful mole in the corner. Except her skin wasn't tan, pale, porcelain-like with a hint of her nationality. And to jokes. Like tell me a fortune, sweetheart, or go ahead and turn the tables. Betty took it with Buddhist serenity. She was used to it, but to the questions about who her parents were and whether any of them were gypsies, the girl could not answer because she simply did not know who her ancestors were. Where did she come from? Betty grew up in the Dandelion Orphanage for as long as she could remember. After the delivery room, she went straight to the orphanage. She was even given a name, either by the nurses at the orphanage or by the staff at the orphanage. Betty didn't know exactly. When Betty was very young, she loved to make up all kinds of stories about her parents. Of course, in the child's eyes, they weren't bad people who abandoned her. They must have been. They had noble reasons. For example, they were saving the world. But where would they fight evil? With an infant. Either her mother was a mysterious princess from another country, and as often happens in fairy tales, lost her baby girl to the forces of evil. As Betty grew up, her thoughts on the matter became more prosaic. Maybe her mother really was a gypsy and a nomad, left her child on the doorstep of the maternity hospital, or maybe she was too young or too poor. She was afraid to take on that kind of responsibility, decided the baby would be better off in an orphanage. Sometimes Betty would look at herself in the mirror, studying the lines of her cheekbones and the curve of her thick lashes. She thought maybe people weren't wrong, her mother had just gotten mixed up with some gypsy who had turned her head and galloped off into the sunset on his raven-haired horse, leaving her with a child under her heart as a keepsake. Then the mother bore the child. She could well have written a no, not to become a single mother. What Betty did not think of at such moments was that she herself might be faced with a similar choice as her biological mother once was. Right now Betty, who had just turned 22 a month earlier, was facing a boss who accused her of all the deadly sins, chief among which, in Adriana's eyes, was adultery. The woman pressed her thin lips, which were always painted with pink lipstick with ridiculously large glitters, and glared sternly at the waitress. I say what I think, or rather what I see. The hostess of the cave said irritably, You, Betty, have grown impudent to work. You are lazy every day. You are getting slower and slower but I would turn a blind eye to it. After all, I feel sorry for you as an orphan. That's why I took you to work, because I felt sorry for a girl without a mother, without a father. But the way you repay me by stabbing me in the back, 
I did not expect that. There's a reason they say you're a gypsy. Yes, a seductress determined to marry Ethan to herself. And you want to hang your child, which you got pregnant by who knows who, on my son, and you want to take the cafe. It's not going to happen. Adriana spoke fearfully. Betty, trying to hold back the tears, but they traitorously rolled from her black eyes in large drops. But I don't go anywhere near Ethan. I swear I didn't even think about it. The fact that I've been slower at work, I'll be fine. It's just that I've been feeling a little queasy lately. Don't tell me stories, and don't you dare lie to me, barked the boss. I know that you have your eye on my son. Everybody's talking about it. Betty sobbed nervously. Arguing with the boss was useless. She knew where the wind was blowing from, and who all these people the woman had mentioned were. Underneath them all was just one malcontent. Christina, she also worked as a waitress, but she had come to see Breeze long before Betty. The girl, who had long had her eye on Ethan, took the appearance of such a sultry beauty as Betty on her turf very keenly. And then Ethan began to give Betty unambiguous signs of attention. The girl, who had enough worries without him, did not react to his flirting, never reciprocated. But the jealous Christina, apparently, decided to simply remove a competitor. She knew how to suck up to her bosses by pitting the owners against Betty. It was she who put the idea in Adriana's head that the new waitress had taken the job with a secret agenda. The black-eyed, white-toothed girl didn't want to serve soups and salads. She wants to seduce her son, Ethan. Christina's words paid off. And now Adriana is a bear zealously defending her only hair from the grabbing hands of the insolent waitress. What's more, the gossip girl had already decided that the girl had used a gypsy love spell to make her boyfriend's head spin. Why else would Ethan pine for? For her. Everybody's looking in her direction. She's got a belly full of baggage. Who'd want her? Certainly not without the rituals of a gypsy sorceress. It didn't go without, of course. The whole thing was nonsense. Betty had no knowledge of gypsy magic, no ability to brew potions of fly agaric, and she hadn't even flown to Sabbaths. She was less interested in Ethan than in the weather on the other side of the globe. And the only reason she got a job at the Sea Breeze was because the cafe was within walking distance of her house, and there was nowhere else she'd been taken during the first months of her pregnancy. Of course, Betty tried to get a better job. She had just graduated from university with a degree in banking. She tried to get a job as a teller in a bank, as an assistant to the financial manager, as a loan officer, only everywhere she went, politely promised to call back. But the phone, of course, was silent. The fact is that the red diploma of a graduate of a prestigious institute was of much less interest to employers than her interesting situation. And to answer the question during the interview, whether she was going to maternity, the girl just could not. She was honest she did not know how to cheat, even for her own good. In addition, Betty often had to deal with other stereotypes. After all, she was from an orphanage, which meant she was dysfunctional. Add to that her mysterious gypsy roots, which were attributed to her hypnotic look, and employers did not want to mess with her at all. What kind of fool would entrust money to a gypsy from an orphanage? However, it was not only in banks. The same pattern was repeated at the clothing store, where she had come to work as an assistant. Was it much of a problem for the perky and brisk Betty to hang dresses from hangers? But the manager with a furrowed brow rejected the brunette candidate without explanation. It was the same at the beauty salon, which required answering the phone and smiling at the reception desk. Betty could read in the eyes of employers what they were thinking the moment they turned her down. Everyone thought the orphans were crippled, mentally crippled, conflicted, stealing, cheating, and bringing more trouble than profit. It was as if the girl had not been brought up in an orphanage, but had been doing time in a maximum security prison since birth. Oh, how Betty worried about that. She was a kind girl, but sometimes she was even angry with superficial people who prophesied a terrible future for her. They say that her fate awaits her beggar or prisoner or a single mother, but that's how it turned out in the end. Some of the predictions came true. 
And now Betty was expecting a child from a man she had loved for a little while, but with all her girlish heart from a man she would never see again. So fate brought the pregnant girl to the door of the Sea Breeze Cafe. That evening the kitchen of the place reeked strongly of stewed cabbage and fried onions. Betty saw a notice on the door that they needed a waiter right away. Without much hope, she went inside. And so she stayed. They gave her a job without a contract. Unofficially, but they paid her well. And the smiling waitress got good tips from her guests. Except that the serene life of a waitress was over. Adriana was determined. I want you to stop working in my establishment. Betty gave her the verdict of a woman, especially since you lied about the timing of the pregnancy. Judging by your belly, you're at least six months pregnant. Why do we need a waitress like you? Think about it. Something's gonna happen. And we'd be in trouble. You're an unofficial employee. How do we call an ambulance? Betty opened her mouth. She opened her mouth to object, to explain that she wasn't lying. She just sighed, clenched her teeth grimly. It was no use shaking the air. All her words bounced back into her hostess's stubbornness. Betty nervously looked around, catching the glances of the visitors. It was dinner time, and the cafe was crowded with diners. Some watched the scene with pity, others with secret admiration and curiosity. How else could it be? After all, they were lucky. They only paid for the lunch special, and they got the spectacle. And they could watch the scandal from the front rows, without taking their eyes off their plates. Beautiful. Under other people's gazes, Betty shamefully covered her stomach with her hands. Though it was a futile exercise, it was sticking out like an impressive lump. Adriana was right about that. It seemed that Betty was not four months pregnant, but just about to go into labor. Meanwhile, Adriana was either stymied by the attention or genuinely unaware of the situation she had put her co-worker in. She continued to lecture Betty, shaming her for her promiscuous lifestyle. You are very young, Betty. And still you think that if you are so beautiful you can get away with anything. No, you don't. You'll have to pay for your mistakes. And anyway, if you were smart enough to have a child, you should have taken care to keep his father with you, and not to look at other people's sons, taught the waitress to be reasonable. I heard you, cafe owner, Adriana, she said quietly, when she had calmed down a little. Unfortunately, I could not keep the father of the child, because it is extremely difficult to bring a man back from the other side of the world from an icy tone. The usually affable Betty and the essence of her words made Adriana a little embarrassed. The woman was embarrassed under the piercing gaze of her dark eyes. Immediately, however, life came together. We are often tripped up by Betty. I've been through a lot myself, and I've seen a lot of people like you in my lifetime. Adriana remarked business-like. You're provoking men just by looking at them with your sunken eyes. So Ethan gave in. So you'd better leave. And your belly is making our guests uncomfortable. Betty closed her eyes tiredly. Her head was a little dizzy, and she was tear-stained, but the tears were over. She'd heard something like this before. People, because of her flamboyant appearance, had treated her as a femme fatal, a heartbreaker. And they had no idea that the girl had a meek character. She was extremely modest, naively romantic, but not at all sophisticated in matters of love. Moreover, Betty had been in love once in her short life, and what did it lead to? Pregnancy. I'll leave my uniform in the back. The girl responded sparingly. I hope they can count me out. Tonight, so I don't have to go back and provoke your son. With these words, Betty turned and walked toward the staff door. That evening, she returned to her apartment in a lost mood. The apartment in which Betty lived was on the fifth floor of an old house. The house was gray and unfriendly. It looked gloomy with its dark windows and rotten balconies at the sparsely placed playground. Inside, the situation was no better. Betty's entryway had once had a combination lock, but it had been broken out by vandals long ago. Now a homeless man could be found there during the cold season, coming into the entranceway to sleep it off. At first Betty was afraid of him, but over time she got used to him. Of course, while she was a student, 
She lived in the dormitory. She was lucky to have a roommate there. There were downsides, of course. For example, the ominous janitor or the common shower room, which was always busy or full of other people's hair, or the common kitchen, where food was stolen, and perhaps also very brazen cockroaches who were not afraid of the light or slippers or squealing girls. But now Betty remembered with almost nostalgia when she was drinking tea and found a red insect along with the tea cakes at the bottom of her mug. What a problem. In some countries, they even eat cockroaches. How on earth did she end up in such a gloomy house after graduation? It was simple. Betty, like all the other graduates of the orphanage, was on the waiting list for government housing. On paper, everything was fine and dandy. But in reality, in reality, no one rushed to give her a roof over her head. She waited her turn for a long time. When Betty received the cherished bundle of keys to the apartment, she was terribly happy. She imagined how she would live alone in a spacious apartment in the morning, stand by the window, look at the metropolis, and drink tea from her favorite mug, even without cockroaches, except that as soon as she walked into her apartment, she was dumbfounded. The old five-story building was in a deplorable condition. The house was in disrepair, but the state, the state stubbornly turned a blind eye to this. The apartment was under the roof. Dark mold had already gathered in the corners, creating a musty smell inside. The roof was leaking, and during the rains, everything poured directly into the apartment, which made the old wallpaper, which had once been bright emerald, but alas, faded to an indistinct shade of grayish green, come away from the walls. In the winter it was so cold in the apartment that a girl had to sleep in a down jacket, covered her head with a blanket. The price for the apartment, written in the contract, clearly did not correspond to reality and was inflated two or three times. What had money been spent for which I could have bought a decent apartment with a fresh renovation? It was unclear. Although no, Betty was well aware that the prescribed amount went into someone's bottomless pocket. But what was to be done and where to turn? She didn't know, and evil people scolded her. They said she was so impudent, this gray duck. She did not earn an apartment herself, and still complaining. Others had been paying the mortgage for 30 years, working three jobs, and she was handed everything ready on a silver platter. And she's showing off like a princess. The gray-haired lady from the housing distribution service angrily said, sign the contract. You should be glad to have a roof over your head. Some people live on the street, biting their lip with resentment and understanding that she was cheated. The orphan signed the necessary documents. She simply could not refuse the apartment. She would have had to wait for a new apartment until her old age. And so she became the owner of a flawed one-room apartment on the outskirts of the city. Although over time, the ingenuous girl got used to both of them, and to the bum on the first floor, and the shouts of neighbors behind the wall. She hoped to improve her life, to buy new cozy curtains, a nice, big bed, make repairs, only all her dreams had been dashed the moment she met his William. And now she remembered the man again. The girl went into the kitchen to unpack the package. The imposing pipe was handed to her by Uncle Liam, who had long worked as a cook at the Sea Breeze Cafe. The cook had grown very fond of the pretty waitress. He treated her like a father. He always fed Betty with leftovers from the kitchen, or he'd cook something special to pamper the girl. Also. Uncle Liam would slip Betty the discarded groceries secretly from the owners. This time Betty found a good supply of provisions in a bag. In the containers the man had packed already prepared food, including her favorite stuffed cabbage rolls. Tears welled up in Betty's eyes as she opened the container and saw three dovecoats lying in a row. For some reason at that very moment she felt pity for herself. Everything that had happened seemed wrong and unfair to her. She had never said a bad word to anyone. Then why had her fate been so cruel? Warming up her dinner in the microwave, Betty sat down at the table. She chewed dejectedly at the delicious cabbage leaves lavished with sauce, and before her eyes were memories from the past. When Betty was graduating from university, an accounting professor came up to her with glad tidings. Betty, I have a wonderful offer for you. 
the man smiled. There's a place for an internship with a friend of mine at an insurance company. You'll have to leave right after your diploma and exams. I suggested your candidacy. You can spend the rest of the summer there to gain experience. Who knows, maybe you'll stay there. What do you think? Everything, of course, pays off. I don't see any reason why I shouldn't, Betty said sincerely. After all, she dreamed of visiting the capital of culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have not had such close students for a long time. The man brushed off. And so it happened that Betty, barely graduated, got on a plane for the first time in her life, flew into town. The insurance company Betty was invited to turned out to be a good place with pleasant colleagues. They accepted the internship with courtesy and hospitality. After work, Betty enjoyed strolling along the palace or admiralty embankment, admiring the monuments and bridges. At that moment, it seemed to Betty that now her life would change dramatically. She breathed with delight, looking at the bright future. And then William appeared on the horizon. The man was incredibly handsome, as if he had stepped out of a commercial for a high-end men's perfume. Blonde bushy hair, piercing, gray eyes, tanned skin, Masculine features made his image even more attractive to the opposite sex. He had broad shoulders, a strong-willed chin, a broad lower jaw, pronounced high cheekbones, and arms with ropes of veins and sinew. Betty had never had a crush on anyone up to that point. At school, she'd met silly boys, and at university she'd been busy gnawing at the granite of science, although Betty was asked out on dates, but she politely refused them all. But whether it was the girl felt unusually mature, ready for a relationship, or the city turned her head, or the look of gray eyes, as if filled with fog, confused the mind. But Betty fell in love. They met trivially in a cafe. Betty was sitting on the summer terrace, enjoying the weather. He came in for coffee. He stared at the girl for a long time, making her look down in embarrassment. And then he approached and asked an unexpected question, girl. I can't take my eyes off of you, the stranger admitted. Can I draw you? Betty was embarrassed at first. She thought it was a modern trick, a way to get acquainted. But she agreed, hesitantly, nodding because she couldn't help but admire the man herself. To her surprise, the blonde did pull out a notebook, which turned out to be a sketchbook, a pair of pencils. He began to sketch a portrait. They got to talking. The man's name was William. He was about to turn 30. He wasn't from around here either. He'd come to town for an exhibition. He lingered, thinking this city was a paradise for creative people. He was indeed an artist, a creative man. And of course, immediately charmed young Betty with such an affectionate, gentle, sensitive and handsome man she had never met. Betty thought of her lover from morning till night, looking forward to another meeting. So Betty and William began to meet. They walked together through the picturesque streets. He became her first love and first man. But their fairy tale ended as abruptly as it began. They were to meet outside the museum that day. William had promised Betty a real tour of its many exhibit halls, except that 10 minutes had passed. Half an hour and William still wasn't there. Betty started calling him. At first she was unhappy with his tardiness, but then she began to worry. William was a punctual sweetheart. He couldn't just forget about her, so something was wrong. This time her intuition didn't let the girl down. When the phone was finally picked up, there was a strange male voice. Hello, you know William. The stranger started off with a direct question. I hesitated, not knowing who to call myself. After all, no one officially called her a girl. But I decided to do it. I'm his girlfriend. What's going on? Where's William? Did he lose his phone? No. Ruined her illusions on the other end of the line. William was in a traffic accident. He was hit in a crosswalk. He's all right. Betty exclaimed, turning abruptly pale and clutching the smartphone in her fingers. What hospital is he in? I'll be there. I now, unfortunately, could not save it. Betty was cut off. The man was explaining something else to her. 
Only Betty couldn't hear him anymore. There was a great noise in her ears. Her eyes went black. The phone slipped from her weakened, shaking hand, hitting the pavement. Betty wobbled. One of the passing tourists, noticing her condition, ran up and picked up the girl, who was slowly falling, losing consciousness. What happened next? Betty remembered poorly. They poured water on her. People tried to talk to her. Someone was looking for a doctor in the crowd. But the girl was indifferent to what was happening. She could not believe that William was gone. Before her eyes stood his face frozen on her lips with a gentle, enigmatic smile. She remembered the artist's hands with long fingers how beautifully they could paint the way they could hold her. Later Betty wanted and was afraid to see his body. However, she mustered the courage to say goodbye to her first love. Betty called the morgue, but they informed her that the man's body had been taken away by his family. They moved him to his hometown. And then summer was over. September came. The internship was also over. The girl who had recently thought about staying in town packed her bags and left town. After all, it had brought her too much pain and grief. Returning to her hometown, Betty hoped to forget her grief. Only fate had decided otherwise. A month later, Betty looked at the calendar with wonder, trying to remember the last time she'd had her period. It turned out to be a long time ago. Of course, there were objective reasons for that. For instance, her cycle might have been disrupted by stress, or by jet lag, or by the change of cities. Or, for example, her first experience with a man. What did the girl experience in the city? Betty didn't think she could get pregnant. She bought a test just in case, just to reassure herself. However, at home she saw two bright lines. The girl bought another test, and a second more expensive one. And then another one. But they all screamed the same thing. Pregnant Betty experienced shock, and then a wave of panic hit her. She sat down on the bathroom floor, sobbing muffledly, covering her mouth with the palm of her hand. And then she no longer tried to contain her emotions, letting the neighbors listen through the thin walls as she howled, moaning like a wounded animal. What am I supposed to do now? William? She asked, swallowing bitter tears. What shall I do with your child? Of course, William did not answer. If poets and writers are to be believed, he was somewhere in the sky on a cloud. And behind the man grew wings. There the muse must have never left the man. He painted his pictures and drank ambrosia. And here she was, here on earth, all alone, without relatives, without a husband. And now she had to face the next blow of fate alone. As the days passed, it was as if Betty had fallen into a melancholy state. At first Betty was determined to have an abortion. She tried to get used to the idea, and she kept picking a date when she could go to the doctor with her delicate problem. But she kept putting it off and putting it off. All the time Betty, being in a strange state, similar to insanity, did not notice how she began to talk to her unborn child. She turned to him more and more, apologizing for herself and her decision. She justified herself by intuitively stroking her still flat belly with the palm of her hand. You, forgive me. She mumbled, turning to the unborn child and feeling like a vile traitor. I'm sorry, but I'm not. I can't be a good mother. I never had one myself. How do I know what it's like to be a mother? Another time she was already crying hugging herself by the shoulders, huddled in a lump in her chair. I have nothing, you know. Sobbed the pregnant girl. I just graduated from university. So where will I go to work when I'm pregnant? How will I support you? My apartment is falling apart. How will you live here? Betty's decision was supported by her friend Kelly. The girls had been friends since their first year at university. Kelly was worth her weight in gold to Betty. Betty had trouble getting along with the other girls. It was as if they sensed the brunette was a rival, hid their boyfriends from her like a black woman. The girl could steal them away like a real gypsy steals a stallion. One incident in freshman year added fuel to the fire of female animosity. Camille's boyfriend, a third year, Stephen dumped his girlfriend and fell in love with Betty. But Betty didn't accept the guy's feelings, but she became a femme fatal. 
Then gossip and rumors quickly spread around the student that she was knocking off guys. Straightforward, sharp-tongued, and fun-loving Kelly, who fell in love with the humble. Betty stood up for her with all her heart. They have been very friendly ever since. You shouldn't ruin your whole life over a holiday romance. And anyway, Betty, how can you do this? One affair in a lifetime, and you're already knocked up. You've got to know how to do that, her friend lamented. Betty cringed at her words. They seemed rude to her. On the other hand, what she was planning to do was terrible. Yet it was Kelly who had agreed to go with her friend to the hospital to get a gynecologist's recommendation. They both sat in hard back chairs waiting their turn. Betty, without blinking, stared at the sign that burned red over the doctor's door. That night she could not sleep a wink. However, the girl had already forgotten the last time she had had a good night's sleep. Must be back in town near William. It says here that it's not dangerous to terminate a pregnancy when it's small. Suddenly informed a friend who was reading one of the free magazines. You can solve everything medically. You don't even need a surgeon. How far along are you? Betty shrugged absently. Her palm touched her belly again, as if protecting the baby. This gesture had so quickly become a girl's habit. A girl accompanied by a doctor came out of the next room. Betty and Kelly glanced sideways because the patient was sobbing. Her shoulders shook with internal tantrums, and her voice snapped. I'm so tired. Stuttering, she told her gynecologist. We've been trying to get pregnant for three years. Every time I take a test, it's like hope floats inside me. And then it slips away from me again and again, leaving an emptiness. I think my husband will divorce me. He probably thinks that I am defective, that you, the doctor with sympathy, stroke the girl on the back. Everything will work out. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Betty invited the nurse to the vacated office. Betty is there. Kelly nudged her friend with a sharp elbow, making her react to the call. Only the girl swallowed and pulled her head into her shoulders. The grief of a woman not being able to give birth to such a long-awaited child had completely thrown her off balance. She was unsure of the decision as it was, and now she really wanted to run away and carry the baby under her heart away from danger. No, whispered Betty to her friend, shaking her head. Let's get out of here. Kelly made huge eyes, but didn't argue. Betty grabbed her friend's arm, and they walked out of the hospital. On the porch of the medical facility, the girl was able to take a breath, filling her lungs with fresh air. She hadn't realized how much. It was stuffy inside those corridors. What are you going to do? Kelly frowned, becoming a young single mother, and then into the program pregnant at 16. You don't pass any pluses in your position by age already. Kelly, I just can't do that. I was abandoned by my mother herself. I can't make it worse by getting rid of the baby. From nerves, Betty snapped at her friend, turning to shouting. The girl's words attracted the attention of passersby, and she squeezed herself frightened Kelly gave her friend a look of blue eyes, and then sighed, hugged her girl tightly. It's okay, sweetheart muttered. Kelly stroked her back. We'll get out of this somehow. At least you'll be the hottest young mom at your baby's parent-teacher conferences and I'll be the hottest aunt, letting him drink wine from my glass. As long as you can't see it, I'll be dropping off money for chips and stuff." Betty laughed. There were tears in her eyes again, but this time from relief. Her whole body and soul finally relaxed, so she had made the right decision. It had been more than three months since Betty had decided to keep the baby. The girl's belly seemed to grow by leaps and bounds only to go to the doctor and get registered, she still could not. Now, when Betty was fired from her job, she again began to plunge into the abyss of despair. The sudden decision to give birth seemed ridiculous to her. If it weren't for you, I'd be working at some good company right now. She was angry at the baby in the womb. What did I get my degree for? To deliver beer, then get fired because of some jerk. No, it's because of you. One problem was followed by another. The apartment was dripping from the ceiling like someone was watering the attic. 
rare droplets collected in various places on the ceiling, forcing the girl to run around with containers, collecting them. Now I don't want to flood the neighbors, muttered the girl. With difficulty, she put the basin under the dirty water in the center of the room because of her large belly. The girl felt an unpleasant spasm. She unclenched her fingers in surprise and let go of the basin. It fell, catching its fellow, pre-positioned bucket, and its contents spilled out on the carpet. That's when Betty, and could not stand it with anger, gritting her teeth, kicked the basin, sending it to the radiator. Like a soccer player sending a ball into the opponent's goal. That must have been the last straw, though in the girl's case, not a drop, but a whole puddle of water. Dan you Betty hissed, looking at the aftermath of the little disaster. She sank tiredly straight to the floor, stretching her legs out in her stomach. Once again, something tugged. Squeezed Betty sobbed. What am I doing with my life? She asked aloud, raising her eyes to the leaking ceiling. Betty felt worse and worse, and she saw no way out of her despair. Her classmates were building a career or a family. And what was she? Strapped into a rundown apartment with a baby all by herself. The next morning, Betty woke up and decided she couldn't go on like this. She overestimated her strength and just couldn't handle it. The girl, not giving herself a chance to change her mind, grabbed her bag and rushed to the hospital. She decided to talk to a surgeon and find out what could be done at such a late stage. In front of Betty's eyes at that moment, it was as if there was a red veil in her temples tensely pounding her stomach tugged. It was as if her baby sensed something wrong. When she approached the reception desk, her throat tightened in a vise, but she still asked the unfriendly receptionist, in which office does the surgeon take? Receiving a dry answer, the girl went up to the second floor. Betty lucky at the door of the surgeon, there was no clue. Only one woman was sitting, staring at her phone and playing something. The girl sat across the chair from the woman. Are you next? Betty asked, nodding at the door this way. She nodded without taking her eyes off the game, which was making a row of balls of the same color. Yes, only the doctor isn't here yet. Jacob stepped back. As if reacting to her words, a man entered the corridor with a frantic confident stride, noticing the patients waiting for him. He smiled broadly. Ladies, are you here to see me? He slipped to the door, unlocking it with his key. Welcome. Ah, Jacob, good morning. The woman spoke. She immediately put down her smartphone, jumping up from her seat and smiling cheerfully. In response, Betty had time to think in passing that the doctor must be either very good or very beautiful. Otherwise, why did the lady blossom so much? Turning her head, Betty first saw the back of a man dressed in a white robe. She assessed the width of his shoulders, his straight posture, and then he turned to let a visitor into his office. Ladies first. He smiled, inviting the woman to come in first. Betty immediately realized that the world around her began to swirl dramatically. The colors flashed and then began to fade and melt away. Blonde, thick hair, piercing, gray eyes, tanned skin. His manly features made his image even more attractive to the opposite sex. A strong-willed chin, a broad lower jaw. It was him. Ah, she exclaimed, frightened, unable to contain her emotions. You, you cannot be. Before her stood the man she loved, even a little, but so sincerely and deeply. There was a man before her, his child she carried under her heart. In front of her was the man who had died, whom she mourned to wither with heartache. Young lady, there is nothing wrong with you. As if through absorbent cotton, a man's voice floated to Betty's ears. A man's voice. You look pale. Girl. 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 Betty realized she was beginning to fall forward, fainting. Strong arms managed to pick her up, saving her from falling as well. The white fabric of the robe flashed before her hazy vision. The man smelled of sterile medicine and something citrusy. It was his perfume, Betty thought. When her consciousness slipped away for good, and before, William smelled of oil paints and wood. When Betty woke up, she didn't know exactly where she was in her nose. The smell of medicine and sterility hit her. It was quiet around her. 
frowning. The girl looked around cautiously, finding herself in a hospital room. There were two other bunks, one of which was unmade, and the other hinted that Betty had a roommate. Only now she was absent, leaving a crumpled blanket and an open book in her place, her eyes downcast. The girl saw the catheter sticking out of her vein. She immediately felt uncomfortable, and the place where the IV was inserted began to sting. She had not liked injections since childhood. She was even afraid of them. She did not like doctors either, and was terribly shy. Perhaps that was the main reason why it took Betty so long to show up at the gynecologist's office. But now she was lying in a hospital room. Her stomach was covered by a hospital blanket, thin but heavy. Betty put her free hand on it, ran her fingers from top to bottom, and back again. The girl turned her head to the window with difficulty. Behind it, smoky clouds of a dark purple hue hung low in the sky. The wind swayed the trees, making them slap their leaves. It was about to rain. How long had I slept, I wondered. Betty wondered. She covered her eyes, not feeling rested at all. The events that had brought her to the hospital room seemed beyond reality. She'd seen William for sure, after all. It wasn't a mirage, not a trick of vision. It was definitely him. No two people were ever the same. There are no coincidences like that. So he's alive. It's just that he tricked me. He took advantage of me while he was on vacation. Tricked and made young fool, charmed her with his drawings and compliments. Then he made up a fairy tale about being dead, got someone to lie to me. But could William have done such a terrible thing? The thoughts that snaked through Betty's head tormented the girl, tearing at her soul. She imagined William the words he whispered to her. She saw the sincerity in his gray eyes, which in the sunlight became lighter and pale silver. Was it all just a game? Could it be that people were capable of lying so skillfully? After all, he still pretended not to know me. He must have been frightened when he saw my belly. Betty clutched the blanket in her fist. She squeezed her eyes shut tight. So I wouldn't let out another batch of tears. No, she wouldn't. She wouldn't cry for him anymore. She'd had enough. Then the door to the room swung open, and Betty thought her roommate had returned. But when she opened her eyes, she was struck dumb again. Seeing the person whose loss you had come to terms with was difficult and strange. She tried to summon up her anger, to look at him haughtily cruel, but she couldn't. Meanwhile, the doctor behaved nonchalantly. He rejoiced when he noticed that the girl was awake. His handsome face brightened. A pleasant smile appeared on his lips. Betty, hello. It's good to see you awake. How are you feeling? Betty was silent, continuing to glare at him. She didn't understand. Was he just kidding? Or did he have selective amnesia? Very convenient, by the way. You could sleep with a girl and disappear, citing headaches. Betty frowned, clenching her teeth. She seriously feared that as soon as he opened his mouth, she would lash out at him with screams and accusations. Noticing that the patient was in no mood for dialogue, the doctor nodded. Not the least bit embarrassed, he handed her an electronic thermometer, offering to take her temperature. You know, you really scared us, especially me, he informed her gently. I've been told I'm a good-looking man, of course, but this is the first time anyone has fainted in front of me. He laughed in a short, titillating way, but his attempt to lighten the mood with an absurd joke was shattered. With a frown of silence, Betty, the man, realizing that the pregnant patient was not going to take her temperature and it seems, even move, the doctor sighed, put the thermometer on the nightstand, where the girl's bag was already standing. Sorry, I had to take your folder with the documents to understand who we are dealing with. However, I could not find the exchange card. And without documents, you didn't recognize me. Betty broke her vow of silence, wondering how warm and weak her voice was. Did I recognize you right away? The man looked at Betty in surprise. He stared at her features, glanced at her lips, so pale at that moment, and peered into her black eyes, the shadows beneath them from their nervous, sleepless nights. I'm sorry, he clarified. We've met. You know, your face seems vaguely familiar to me, but I can't remember you. 
Betty twitched as if from a slap in the man's face and tone. She could see that he didn't recognize her. Either he thinks Betty has lost his mind, seeing him as someone else. Just then a nurse flew into the room. When she saw the surgeon, she splashed her hands, abruptly through Jacob. There you are. We have an emergency. Patient in room one again. A man has to get ready for surgery. It is scheduled for tomorrow morning. And she brought chocolate and is eating it quietly. You should talk to her or no enema will help. All Betty could catch from the nurse's emotional tirade was Jacob's name. That sane woman in line also called him Jacob. Could it be that it wasn't him? The man rolled his eyes toward the ceiling for a brief moment, as if asking the Almighty for help with naughty patience. In that second, he seemed very young to Betty. Then the doctor looked at her again. Would you take her temperature, please? Kathy will come and get a thermometer and change your drip. I'll be right back. Now Betty was even more surprised. Could she be asleep, caught up in another reality? Or had she fallen into a Mexican soap opera? William, it turns out, has a twin brother. The girl obediently slipped the thermometer under her arm, staring at the ceiling. The nurse beside her began to fuss, replacing the empty bottle of solution with a new one. This must be the Kathy. In passing, the girl thought, handing the young blonde the thermometer, which began to beep. Hypothermia. The nurse shook her head and then translated her words into human language from the doctors. You have a low temperature, sunshine. This condition can occur with physical and nervous exhaustion. There are other reasons, but I vote for this one. You're so pale and thin. You have to eat for two now. The nurse went on to speak, lavishing Betty with pregnancy advice. She turned out to be nice, even too nice. She constantly called the patient, Sunshine, Kitty, and Beauty. Such kindness from a stranger made Betty's heart ache. It also made her remember why she had come to the hospital in the first place. What's the matter with you? It'll be all right, Kathy exclaimed, seeing that Betty was about to burst. Don't you worry, I'm not. Betty snapped. I don't know why I cry all the time. It's normal. The nurse nodded. Pregnant women are all emotional. I was paranoid when I was pregnant. I kept thinking something was going to go wrong. I read about a million complications when I was still in school. Yes, how to try them on myself and the poor baby. I was a fool. But now my son is four years old and he's just a sweetheart. Betty blinked, looking at the nurse again. She looked very young, energetic, cheerful. She talked about her son with a smile on her face. Somehow that example gave Betty strength, rekindled everything in her soul. There was a glimmer of hope in her soul, and also resentment, anger, and misunderstanding of what was going on gave her back her strength. She decided to find out what was going on, and then she would leave here with her child, her not William. He certainly wasn't worthy of him. The girl tried to find out something about the surgeon by asking Kathy leading questions. She was chatty and shared information with ease. And he's not an artist. Unintentionally, Betty asked. I just think I've seen an artist who looks a lot like him. Either I haven't, or I don't know one. I haven't worked in this hospital that long. The nurse shook her head and then smiled slyly. Did you like him? Yes, everybody likes him except that he's married. His wife, by the way, is a bitch, and how they got together. I don't know. I had a chance to talk to the surgeon only in the evening after dinner, which was heavily criticized by the girl's neighbor. Again, this cottage cheese casserole, she grumbled. It makes my stomach swell. Are not in the hospital are not supposed to monitor the healthy diet. She was right about something, the casserole they'd been given. It only had a name for the word cottage cheese, it was a huge lump of dough that looked like sweet plasticine. It was only occasionally interspersed with pure cottage cheese, but Betty liked the whole treat and the sweet yellow pudding on top brought back memories of her childhood. Barely had the girl carried her empty plate away when she met the surgeon in the hallway. He didn't notice her with a determined stride, retreating toward William's procedure room. The girl began, but bit Jacob's tongue. He turned abruptly, finding Betty's gaze for a moment. 
There was doubt in his gaze. Still, the man approached her. Betty nodded politely to the man. I'll come in, as I promised to discuss your condition. We'd like to keep you in the hospital for a while. Tomorrow morning, you can visit the gynecologist, have an ultrasound. But now, I'm sorry, Jacob interrupted him. Betty hurriedly before she lost her resolve. My question will seem strange to you. You might decide to send me not only to a gynecologist, but also to a psychiatrist. But she took a convulsive breath and blurted it out. You have a twin brother because you look very, very much like the father of my child. The girl hugged her arms around her stomach, feeling her fingers trembling. She even wanted to squeeze her eyes shut so she wouldn't see the surgeon's reaction, but that would have been downright childish. But Jacob didn't laugh at her or even call the paramedics. His gaze became frowning like the rainy sky outside the window. The man slowly lowered his gaze and looked at the girl's belly, a child by William. Hearing her lover's name, Betty felt her heart skip a beat. She leaned forward, clutching at the man's hand. William, she nodded. I was told he was killed in an accident. You're his brother. It's just that when I saw you, I thought you could tell me he wasn't dead. The man looked up at the girl's face in sorrow. In his eyes, Betty realized that she had hoped in vain for another miracle. Her shoulders drooped. She loosened her fingers, letting go of the surgeon's hand rather than the artist's. I'm sorry, but my brother is gone. Quietly, he said, and you. I understood why your face was familiar to me. I had seen you in William's drawings. You, Betty, he told me about you. The girl turned her face away. I wish he had told me about you, she muttered. Maybe then I wouldn't have been so close to losing my mind. Jacob rubbed his face. His gaze clung again and again to the belly of Betty, where his nephew or niece was. You know, the girl smiled sadly, looking at the floor. Come to think of it, William didn't tell me about himself at all. He talked about something eternally beautiful, never about earthly things, never about family or childhood. And I thought he was just like me. I don't like to reminisce about the past myself. Nothing to brag about when you were born in an orphanage. Only now it all seems so ridiculous to me. I'm expecting a child from a man I didn't even know anything about. Did he really love me? Betty flinched as she felt a man's palm touch her shoulder. Jacob smiled cheerfully. He loved you, Betty. I'll bring you his letters and drawings. I will. Then you'll understand. William was just different. He wrote letters, not texts. He drew instead of talking about feelings. He was a wonderful person. I think you're a wonderful girl too. After all, my brother saw beauty better than anyone. Not just outward beauty, but beauty of the soul. Betty didn't know if his words were just a way to comfort her, but they were a balm poured over her weary soul. The next day brought another surprise for the mother-to-be. Jacob was in the office when the obstetrician gynecologist ran the ultrasound probe over her abdomen. The girl was pre-lubricated with petroleum jelly. Betty was lying on the couch, nervous. At that second, she felt Jacob's fingers touch her wrist. Betty, are you all flushed? Calm down. Cheerfully, he smiled. It's just an ultrasound. Are you thinking about finding out the sex of the baby soon? Betty smiled tautly. I think my stomach is too big. She whispered to the surgeon. It's actually normal. Jacob didn't have time to answer. A female gynecologist entered the dialogue. It's normal, mommy. Absolutely normal. She responded cheerfully, looking at the monitor screen. After all, two babies need more space. How much? The girl began to stutter. Her eyes widened. Two, there are two children. Yes, congratulations. The doctor smiled. But I do not need two. I don't know how I'll cope with one. Betty got indignant. Now she turned pale, now she blushed. She turned to the surgeon tenaciously, squeezing his fingers, whispering fervently. Tell her, I don't need to. There was fear and panic in Betty's tone. Jacob, though he tried to restrain himself, gave up, laughing at Betty. It's not a store. 
but I can't handle two kids, she exclaimed. Two boys. The obstetrician cut in again. Betty leaned back with her head on the couch with a desperate groan, the two boys in her belly part of the soccer team. Betty, don't worry, Jacob said, unexpectedly, I'll help you. After all, these children are no strangers to me. The girl turned her head, looking at the man gratefully. Something stirred in her soul, and she turned away, not letting the warmth spread any further. Jacob just looks a lot like his brother, she thought. That's why all kinds of nonsense popped into her head. From then on, Betty and Jacob spent more time together. Even when she was released from the hospital, the man called frequently. They met and talked. He was very interested in her health, worried about his nephews. Jacob gave her drawings of William, and Betty shared her feelings over a cup of tea. Our love with William was beautiful and fleeting. I like to imagine her, in the form of a moth, she smiled sadly, stirring the sugar with a spoon. Why? The man raised his eyebrows, eating the cherry pie he ordered. Betty looked thoughtfully at Jacob fleetingly, noting that his brother didn't eat sweets at all. Despite their outward resemblance, they were different in everything she managed to realize. But they're just beautiful. Only these amazing butterflies live no more than 24 hours, during which they have time to be born leave offspring and die. They burn brightly, but they burn so quickly. They fulfill what they came into the world to do. Then in flakes of snow and ashes of their wings, they sink to the surface of the pond. The comparison was poetic, and Betty felt ashamed of such thoughts. She looked away to the window, beyond which evening was already falling, and when she glanced timidly at the silent Jacob, her heart began to race. He was looking intently, penetratingly into her soul. Betty hastily grabbed the white cup, as if she wanted to hide behind this action, to hide the feelings arising in her heart from his attentive gaze. You shouldn't feel anything like that, reminded herself of Betty when Jacob brought her home. He just looks like William. That's why you're going crazy. And then there's the hormones. And it's not right or fair to William. He only cares about you because you're carrying his nephew in your belly. And if that's not enough for you, Betty, remember that Jacob is married. With such thoughts, the girl successfully reassured herself. She silenced her nascent feelings. The sprouts of love did not have time to grow stronger. She had already pulled them out of her heart like weeds. But as soon as Jacob smiled at her and asked her if she had eaten well or brought the book he had mentioned earlier, they burst out again from the frozen soil of her feelings. Their life was going smoothly, even happily. Betty felt she was not alone, so the thought of having two children no longer seemed daunting to her. However, when the day of delivery was approaching, and she went to the hospital to go to bed for preservation, fate dealt her a new blow. That evening, a visitor came to see her. Upon learning that there was a girl waiting for her in the lobby, Betty rejoiced. Maybe Kelly came running, she thought, buttoning her robe and slipping her feet into rubber slippers. However, a stranger was waiting for her in the lobby. The gorgeous blonde examined Betty with a frown. Are you the Betty? Yes, she hummed. And you're the woman who wasn't taught to introduce herself. Betty raised her eyebrows. She didn't like the girl right away. She'd only been attacked by women like that at school before. She also reminded her eerily of Christina from the diner. I'm Jacob's wife, the blonde said dryly. And you, not getting one brother, decided that another would do. What do you mean? A scowl. Betty pulled her robe tighter around her. I have a business proposition for you, said the lady as she sat down in her chair and put her leg over her head. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Betty. It just so happens that Jacob and I can't have children. I'm sorry, muttered the girl to fill the pause. The blonde girl wrinkled her nose and waved it off. For me, procreation was never high on my list of priorities. I don't get it. Betty fluttered her hands around. The woman tapped her hand. What's not to understand? I'm a model. I can't have a baby. I have a career that depends on looks. Swapping magazine covers for diapers. Who in their right mind would do that? Betty considered the question rhetorical, 
and politely remained silent. The blonde continued her monologue. Only Jacob, he's crazy, you see. You can't have a family full of happiness if there's no children's laughter in the house. After his brother's death, he's gone completely insane. We started talking about kids more often, and it ended up in nothing but scandals. He distanced himself from me and spent all his time at work. And so was I. We could not see each other for weeks. He withdrew into himself. And then you came along. She glanced crookedly at Betty, who hadn't wanted to be here, listening to the confessions of another man's relationship. But I was met by Betty. But I'm on friendly terms with Jacob honestly. Maybe the model stretched out, tilting her head to the side. Except now, I don't recognize Jacob. He's waiting for your kids like some kind of miracle, like you're the Virgin Mary. And you don't have two kids there. You have a new Jesus. You know, it pisses me off when your husband, who never paid any attention to you, starts spending all his free time with a pregnant girl. The blood rushed to Betty's face, but she exhaled and calmed down. Yes, Jacob's wife was probably entitled to resentment and jealousy. Betty hadn't even considered how much time Jacob devoted to her. If your husband is so eager to be a father, perhaps you should reconsider. Softly, the girl said, if you gave your spouse a child, he would be happy. The blonde woman said grudgingly, oh, come on, do you even hear me? I'm not giving birth. He needs the baby, not me. You don't have to give birth. Betty raised her eyebrows. There are orphanages. I don't want to adopt the son of some drug addict or alcoholic from an orphanage. The blonde squinted squeamishly. The surrogate is long and painful, and the embryos might not take root in the womb. And you have twins like William and Jacob in your belly. Same genetics. My husband is already in love with them. It works for me. I don't fully understand where you're going with this. Betty got nervous. She didn't like the tone of the conversation or the blonde's innuendo. Don't be silly, poked the model. I want you to give Jacob your twins, let him take care of them, hire a nanny, and you. But you have nothing to give them anyway. Your husband has no job and no prospects either. You're young, you're cute. You'll have a baby while you're still married. If you get married and with children, no one needs you. Remember, it's a fool. Sure, I'm ready to pay you. How much do you want? We'll agree on an amount. Betty looked at the girl with silent amazement. Maybe she was joking, though she remembered Jacob joking during her first ultrasound that this wasn't a store, but here was his wife coming in and demanding a live sale to her. Perhaps if someone had come to her with such a suggestion five months ago, she would have pondered the answer. However, now that she has become friends with Kathy's young mother, when she met Jacob, feeling his support and believing in herself and her strength again, now she wouldn't even think of giving up her babies to anyone. Betty stood up from her chair. She looked down at the uninvited guest. I'm sorry, I still don't know your name, but I have to decline your offer. Moreover, my children are no match for you because I myself am from an orphanage. I have no idea. What if my parents were alcoholics or drug addicts? She grinned bitterly and crumpling her goodbyes, turned around to go back to her room. Before the pregnant girl could take a couple of steps, she was grabbed by the arm from behind. The surgeon's wife yanked her back, sharply turning her face toward herself. The rubber slippers refused to slide, causing the girl to stumble. She lost one flip-flop, standing on the floor in her sock. Betty looked at the blonde with apprehension and surprise. What do you allow yourself? What do you allow yourself? The model hissed in her face. You think I can't see what you want? Jacob, you will not get, but I'm not afraid. Shut up, okay. Maybe you don't understand, but you don't have much of a choice. Either you give us those offspring and live in peace, or I'll burn you to death. We both know Jacob won't get away from you that easily. He's too kind, damn doctors always poking around where he's not wanted. He wants to help the sick and the poor, so he's got it in his head that he's supposed to help you. The model's long, sharp fingernails dug into her hand, wrinkled, feeling the pain of scratches on her skin. 
Let me go or I'll scream, warned the girl, trying to pull her hand out of her grip. But the blonde's fingers clenched harder, like a knotted trap. It was as if she hadn't heard Betty. Stared into her face with an insane stare. The model was so close that Betty could smell the alcohol emanating from the girl. Now she was really scared. It turned out Jacob's wife was desperate. Betty didn't know what was going on in their marriage. Jacob didn't like to talk about his wife, as if she didn't exist at all. But what the girl saw in front of her was frightening. I have connections, the blonde continued to squeeze her wrist. You won't be able to live a normal life if Jacob keeps dragging himself to you. I don't know what's got him booked. Your weird looks or your fatherly feelings. Or maybe he just feels sorry for an orphan abandoned by his brother. But you're not going to make it. He's mine. Betty, she knew that it was useless to argue and that the only right thing to do would be to simply run away and escape outside the door of the ward, pulling on her arm again. This time she managed to pry her wrist from the model's insistent fingers, except she didn't get very far. She stumbled in her slippers, struggling to keep her balance, losing precious seconds in the process, running up the stairs late. I warned you, stupid, shouted the blonde after her, the next second she was running up the stairs like a fury after her victim. Betty felt a sharp pain in the back of her head as the stranger's hand tugged at her thick braid. The only slipper she'd miraculously left on her foot slipped off. The girl stumbled. She began to fall backward. She cried out in a loud, frightened, bird-like voice, flapping her arms like wings. Only she could not save herself and fly away. Someone's voices were heard and then the worried cries of other visitors to the hospital, previously busy with their own concerns, finally paid attention to the pregnant woman. But it was too late. Betty for a moment opened her eyes wide, squeezed her fingers, trying to catch the air, and then doomfully frightened, clenched her eyes. Not the babies. Not my babies, the girl thought, awkwardly, intuitively putting her hands under her back as she fell. The next moments blended into something blurry. She felt her back and shoulders crash into the hard steps. Her breath jumped out of her chest, and she could no longer gain air back. Betty hit the back of her head on the step. Her head spun. The girl rolled down, covering her stomach with her hands. Even as everything around her went dark and consciousness escaped her, she once more frantically hugged her stomach with her thin arms, trying to save the babies from being hit. Betty Betty heard William's voice through the noise in her head. No, not William. It was Jacob's scream. Such concerned, filled with genuine emotion. Frightened. Shock. Panic. Everything was in it. The girl's lips quivered, wanting to say Jacob's name. Her eyelashes quivered as she tried to open her eyes, in a desperate desire to see the face of a loved one but she could do neither. Betty felt the warm man's hands on her shoulders, and then she lost her senses. She opened her eyes, feeling weak and nauseous. Coming to her senses and seeing the room around her, it was already a habit of hers. I was afraid of doctors for nothing, thought the girl languidly. Now I am here more often than at home. But the next second she remembered something else. She had fallen down the stairs. Now Betty looked down, realizing that her belly was still big, as if deflated like a punctured balloon. There were no babies inside her. Her pulse jumped instantly, blood rushing to her face. The girl jumped up on the bed, ignoring the pain. At the same second, Kathy entered the room and seeing her patient, spluttered her arms. Betty, how good, she rejoiced. Are you awake? Where are the children? Betty asked at once. My stomach. What about the children? Kathy waved her arms, either trying to get air into her patient or to calm her down. Betty Betty is fine. Please calm down. The babies were born, healthy, strong, cool, just the way they were born. The girl exhaled. And me. I didn't give birth. You had a bad bump and you were unconscious. But our doctors worked a miracle. Jacob was personally present at the operation. He was the one who made the decision. The doctors had to perform an emergency C-section, 
For several days your consciousness was floating. What didn't Betty understand? Well, you'd wake up, then go back to sleep. There were brief lapses of consciousness, the nurse explained. Jacob called often. He was exhausted, running around you. Where are my children now? I want to see them. They're safe. That woman threatened them. She won't get to my children. Again the girl Clara worried, didn't she? Jacob's wife. The nurse shook her head. Though I guess after that scandal, she's already his ex. Kathy said that Jacob appeared in the hallway at the moment when Slaga pulled Betty's hair, provoking her to fall. After that, the man was tearing and tearing. I'd never seen him in that state before, when he made sure you were carried off to the operating room. The nightmare began. He had to be held by two orderlies. They're big. They couldn't handle our Jacob. Can you imagine why they kept him? They thought he was going to attack his wife and wipe her out. Naturally, he yelled at her so much, it made the windows in the hospital shake. It was quite a commotion. She sobbed. But who would believe her tears? I don't. Honestly, Betty. I wanted to get in that model's face myself. Then Kathy turned to the door to the ward. And making sure no one was there, leaned over to whisper to the girl. I mean, they'd been on bad terms before. As far as I know, this model had cheated on him with some director, hoping to become an actress as well. He forgave her for some reason, but the relationship started to deteriorate. And after that scandal, I'm sure a divorce is just around the corner. The nurse moved back to her usual tone. That's a good thing too. Jacob needs another wife, kind, sweet, family-oriented. Like you, for instance. There was a hint in the nurse's slee voice and sly gaze, but Betty was still unable to grasp such subtleties. Betty blinked, digesting the information, though at this second she was more interested in just seeing her children. And then she'll figure out the rest. I'll get your babies, don't worry, Kathy smiled. In response to the young mother's request, the children were soon brought in. Only not Kathy came to the room alone, but Jacob came with her. The medical staff each had a tiny baby boy in their arms, seeing their faces, one discontented and the other peaceful. Betty cried again, this time from the happiness that filled her to the brim. She pressed her sleeping children to her chest, admiring their tiny fingers, their tiny button-like noses, puffy lips. Jacob cautiously sat down next to them. Betty looked up at him, trying to express her appreciation and love for this man that had accumulated in her soul. She saw the tenderness with which the surgeon looked at her. The girl noticed that Kathy had left them alone, tactfully closing the door, only when there was tension in the air. You're all right, Betty. The doctor broke the silence. Nothing hurts. Are you asking as a doctor? Asked the girl in reply. No, shook his head. How is your friend? Betty lowered her lashes for a moment, hiding the prick. Disappointment. He's fine. She nodded, not looking at the man. Thank you, Jacob, for everything you've done for me, for my children I. I don't know what I would have done without you. Jacob's fingers gently touched her chin, lifting her face and returning the look in her black eyes to her face. I'm sorry. I lied. He exhaled suddenly. The place where his fingers touched her face warmed. Betty's cheeks flushed, too. About what? The girl whispered. I'm not. As a friend worried about you, Betty. I thought it was all wrong at first. After all, you know, William and I, because of our outward resemblance, were always dividing the world in half. We defended our individuality, our territory went our separate ways, loved different things interacted with different people. So when I saw you, something from my forgotten childhood woke up in me. I wasn't allowed to love what my brother loved, even though he wasn't around anymore. I thought I was betraying the memory of him. However, when I saw you fall, Betty, I thought I would die myself. If anything happened to you, I've never felt anything like that in my life, you know. It stunned me. It blew up inside of me. And that's ridiculous. I'm still a doctor. I don't believe in that kind of crap. 
But for a moment I even felt like some of my feelings came from my twin brother, because that's a lot for me alone, you know, too many of them, and they all belong to you. Betty froze, listening to the fiery speech, the man's heart beating frantically in his chest. I can't be your friend Betty, Jacob continued, adding uncertainly, only if you let me, of course. Betty did not know what to say to the man. What was happening seemed like a fairy tale for a happy ending, which she dared not hope for even in her wildest dreams. Instead of answering, Betty stepped forward to kiss the man briefly and gently on the lips. The kiss came out short, naive, but there was so much feeling in it, unspoken words and promises, that Jacob understood everything. He smiled happily, openly. The man rested his forehead against the young mother's forehead. They both laughed, feeling happy and awkward at the same time. The children were happy to finally know the embrace of a loving mother. Quietly their clenched fists, propped cheeks, noses, peacefully sniffing, what shall we call them? Jacob asked Betty, hugging her gently by the shoulders. His voice was full of affection and concern. They would still have time to sort out the names, and they would have time to figure things out with the abnormal slaga too. They could handle everything now. After all, they had found each other this way. Being in the place she had been so afraid of in the hospital room before, Betty felt completely happy for the first time in her life. After all, she had beautiful healthy children in her arms, her shoulders wrapped around a man who was reliable and in love with her, and her heart was overflowing with love. She thought of William, too. One day, she thought he had taken everything away from her, throwing her into the abyss of despair. But it turned out that he had given her everything. Betty hastily brushed away a tear. Thank you, William. In her mind, she turned to the man, holding the children tighter. Thank you for everything. Five years have passed. The twin brothers, James and William, fought again in kindergarten. In fact, it was James who started the fight, as usual. William, who was a quiet boy, just couldn't stand by as his brother waved his fists. In the end, both mischievous Betty became, putting bruises on their faces with cream. You're about to get kicked out. Mom began. Generously applying ointment to the bruises would be a glorious joke, James. I can't do this anymore. Eating their awful gruel and sleeping. Mom in the afternoon, I can't wait to go to school. William was patiently silent, only wrinkling his nose when his mother touched the hardest part of his skin. Is that what you think now? The woman shook her head. Adult life is not so happy. Do not try to grow up faster. Wow, crafty. What a nose pulled James. Then why are you and Daddy always so cheerful and happy? Betty laughed merrily and twirled the cap on a tube of cream. It's because we have sons who are so mean, but endlessly loved, like you, she explained to the kids. James only hummed. William, on the other hand, smiled softly. And when the little sister comes, will you be even happier? He asked looking judiciously at your mother's big belly. I think so, nodded Betty lovingly, looking at her son, both boys, when they learned six months ago that they would have a sister or brother, were very happy. They were so used to sharing everything. So there was no jealousy about the new baby and the children. And when the boys found out they were getting a little sister, they all imagined at once how they would be chivalrously protecting their princess. William wanted to say something else, but when he heard the key turn in the front door lock, he jumped up from his seat. So did his brother. They both rushed to meet their father. My God, what's the matter with you guys? Betty heard her husband's astonished voice. Did you have a fight with the army? No, but there were five of them and two of us. Betty explained with a duck-like gait appearing in the corridor. There the man had already managed to grab both sons in his arms. He leaned over, kissing his wife on the forehead. What are you going to tell our kids? She raised her eyebrows. Betty, expectantly, looked at her husband. He looked at the boys, waiting to be lectured. I hope you guys win, Jacob said with a smile. William and James laughed happily, and Betty shook her head, admitting defeat. After all, 
she was outnumbered, one girl among a squad of guys, and then little Miranda would be born. And then we'll see how you all sing. The woman giggled in her mind. Let's go to the table. She called her favorite men to dinner. The kitchen was warm and smelled of apple pie, which they had picked themselves in the country house last weekend. Betty felt the same in her soul as she did in the kitchen, warm and cozy. There was a magical happiness there.